Good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Sanjeev Bhoi, Professor of Emergency Medicine Department. And uh, uh, today we are going to uh, present to you one of the key concepts of pain free emergency department, which is the benchmark of quality of care in the emergency department. Dr. Abhiraj is uh, going to present, Junior Resident Emergency Medicine, and Dr. Uh, Ashwin is going to do the discussion. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Respected faculty members and dear colleagues, good afternoon to one and all. I'm Dr. Abhiraj, junior resident in the Department of Emergency Medicine. And on behalf of my department, I welcome you all to the clinical combined rounds. Today, we are going to pin the pain with pen. I would like to introduce an interesting case which we could manage a few weeks back in our trauma unit. It was a 32-year-old male patient who presented to a trauma unit with alleged history of a road traffic crash. The patient was a rickshaw driver being hit by a tractor at around 8 p.m. near Shamli, Uttar Pradesh. Patient was complaining of left hip pain and he was unable to bear weight post-op. There was no history of headache, vomiting, loss of consciousness, seizure, any kind of AD bleed, shortness of breath, chest pain or abdominal pain. Patient was triaged yellow as per AIMS trauma triage protocol. Now let's come to the primary survey. His airway was patent and C-spine was stabilized. He was breathing at a rate of 20 cycles per minute with a rumen saturation of 96%. Bilateral normal vesicular blood sounds heard, chest compression test was negative. Pulse rate was 96 beats per minute with a non-invasive blood pressure of 130 over 78 millimeters of mercury. Pelvic compression test was positive and EFAS was negative. GCS was E4, V5, M6. Bilateral pupils were equal and showed normal reactions to length. Chest X-ray and pelvic X-rays were ordered. Moving on to the secondary survey, patient was constantly complaining of severe pain in his left hip. The pain score was 8 out of 10 on defense and veteran scale. There was limitation of movements of left lower limb and he was unable to bear it. At this point, we gave injection fentanyl 50 microgram IV stat for analgesia. There was no history of any specific allergy and there was no prior comorbidities as well. In the past history, there was nothing significant and last meal was taken at 6 p.m. Events leading to trauma, patient was a rickshaw driver being hit by a tractor at around 8 p.m. He was then taken to a nearby hospital at 9 p.m. on the same day where he received injection tremor 50 mg IV IIM for analgesia. Then he was referred to higher center. He, was, he presented to our department at 11.30 p.m. on the same day. If you see the head to toe examination findings of this patient, everything was within normal limits except that the left lower limb was held in a position of adduction and internal rotation. Pain was persisting and the pain score was still 8 out of 10. And now let's focus on the left lower limb of this patient. As I mentioned earlier, lower limb was held in a position of adduction and internal rotation. Abduction, external rotation and extensions were limited at the hip joint. Neurovascular status of the limb was within normal limits. Based on the given history and the above mentioned clinical findings, we suspected a posterior dislocation of left limb and extra pelvis with hip was available at 11, 12.30 a.m. And as you can see, see in this extra film, the Shinton's line, the continuity of Shinton's line is broken on the left side with apparently no discontinuity of the trabecular meshwork and there is As you can see here, the continuity of Shinton's line is broken on the left side with apparently no discontinuity of the trabecular measure or any cortical blockage. There is no associated injuries or fractures of the pelvis, head, neck, trochanter or even the proximal humerus. This confirmed our clinical diagnosis of posterior dislocation of left, left hip. As you all know, all dislocations of, of hip has to be reduced as early as possible, preferably within 6 hours to reduce the risk of avascular necrosis of head of hip. The risk of avascular necrosis is less than 10% if there is a delay of 10 hours after the injury, which increases to approximately 25% if there is a delay of 15 hours after the injury. So we proceeded to attempts at reduction in the ED. In the first attempt, we used Ali's method for the reduction of hip job. And for procedural sedation and analgesia, we gave injection fentanyl 50 microgram and injection metazolam 4 milligram. And in Ali's method, the patient is placed in supine position and with an assistant stabilizing the pelvis 
by applying a downward pressure on both anterior superior iliac spine. A constant longitudinal traction is applied by uh, holding the limb at the knee joint. With continued traction, with continued traction, the limb is uh, flexed so that hip is brought to 90 degree flexion along with 90 degree flexion of the knee joint as well. You can add gentle internal rotation also with this manner to aid facilitation, uh, to facilitate a successful reduction. After reduction, with continued traction, the limb is brought in a position of extension, both at the hip joint as well as at the knee joint. But the first attempt failed. Then we made one more attempt, but at this point, we gave injection ketamine 30 milligram and injection propofol 30 milligram as a part of procedural sedation and analgesia. The method used was the same Alice method, but this attempt also failed. So after two successive failed attempts, we made a call to the definitive care discipline and then they decided to take the patient to OT to reduce the dislocation under general anesthesia. But there was a delay for availing the OT. And during this time, we made one more attempt. But at this time, we gave pericapsular nerve group block or pen block for analgesia. It was carried uh, by the senior resident in the department who has been trained in nerve blocks. Uh, it is done using ultrasound guidance under all aseptic precautions and strict safety measures were taken. Reduction method used was Alice method only and the pain score became 2 by 10 within 15 minutes of giving pain block. And at this time, the reduction was successful. In pedicapsular nerve block or pen block, we deposit the local anesthetic agent 1% lignocaine with adrenaline 4.5 mg per kilogram and 0.25% BPVAC 1 mg per kilogram in the facial plane just lateral to the tendon of just lateral to the tendon of psoas major muscle in at the iliopubic eminence. As you can see in this sonodactyl. As I mentioned earlier, after successful pen block and uh, reduction of hip joint, the pain score drastically reduced from 8 by 10 to 2 by 10. Safe range of motion of hip was assessed. Neurovascular examination after successful reduction was within normal limits. And post reduction extra pelvis confirmed a successful reduction of hip, uh, hip joint without any other associated fractures. Patient was observed for 6 hours in ED to look for any local anesthesia related systemic toxicity and then he was discharged from the ED and asked to follow up in orthopedic opinion. This was the post-reduction X-ray pelvis and bilateral group, which showed successful reduction. To discuss more about the pen block and pen block assisted reduction of hip dislocation, I would like to invite Dr. Ashwin, senior resident in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abhiraj. As Abhiraj had already explained to you, uh, how an obvious or OT case was treated in our emergency and discharged uh, by a simple technique called pen block. So we need to get more details about how this block is done. What, what actually is this pen block? How this block is done? Now what are the nerves that we like, encounter in this uh, block? And how safe the uh, block is? Other, uh, what all other options we have for similar? So just get into the finer details. So pen. Uh, so pen block is basically a pericapsular nerve group block. It's basically first described in 2018 by Laura Graham and Philip Peng. And it basically it's a uh, sensory nerve group block and does not target any motor nerves. The three main nerves uh, which are uh, three main uh, sensory nerves which are targeted are articular branch of the femoral nerve, uh, the obturator nerve and the uh, accessory obturator nerve. Uh, just coming to the, some relevant anatomy, uh, the pelvis, there is the iliacus muscle and the psoas major muscle, which arises on the pelvis and, cross, uh, and crosses the pelvic brim to attach the lesser trochanter. Uh, so uh, if we remove this muscle, we, we get two main prominences. One is the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is seen laterally, and other one is the iliopubic eminence, which is seen medially. These two are the main uh, sauna anatomic landmarks for pen block. So uh, we also have the uh, <coughs> sorry uh, inguinal ligament, which is arising from the uh, anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. And within this compartment, we have the iliacus muscle, psoas tendon, the femoral vessels, and the femoral nerve. We need to avoid this femoral nerve while giving the pen block. 
and we need to charge it on these three uh, nerves as I have already explained which is the articular branch of the femoral nerve, the accessory obturator nerve and the uh, obturator nerve, articular branch of the obturator nerve. Basically these three uh, um, nerves are the one which supply the uh, capsule around the hip joint. Once we give the pen block in the correct uh, in the pelvic brief, the, these areas are anesthetized as seen in the picture. So it is, it is very useful in fractures like uh, fracture neck of FEMA, IT fracture, acetabular fracture, SPR fractures and IPR fracture. This is further complemented by many studies which are already done in emergency department across the world. Very, various case report case series which all uh, suggest the same thing. Like uh, uh, how the pen block is useful in these hip fractures. So uh, coming to the preparation part for any block. We first we need to have a written informed consent about the procedure and the complications. Then we need to have two types of needles. One is the uh, one is the small 23 to 25 gauge needle, uh, which is used for the skin infiltration, and the bigger one, which is the nerve block needle, which should be at least 85 millimeter in length. And also the drugs. Drugs we may, uh, commonly use are 0.25 percent bupivacaine, 1 to 3 mg per kg, and 1 percent lignocaine with adrenaline, 5 to 7 mg per kg. We can also use ropivacaine, which is a more safer, better drug. But it's not available in our department, so we usually use the bupivacaine and lignocaine. Uh, others, other things in preparation basically includes the general, uh, general sterile precautions like the uh, sterile surgical gloves the gauze piece, the other beta in or thing. Then the USD machine with a sterile car should be used. And last but not the least, we should always be prepared for the worst. Like you should have a crash cut with 20% uh, intralipid emulsion also, uh, in which I will be discussing in the coming slides. So coming to the ergonomics and patient preparation, uh, this is an image just for uh, demonstration. It's not the actual uh, image. Uh, the patient body part is prepared using uh, standard sterile precaution and later the uh, ultrasound is placed in such a way that it's opposite to the lower limb of interest and is in line with the uh, person performing the uh, ultrasound. And there should be two persons. One person should be uh, using the ultrasound and guiding the needle and the second person should be injecting the local anesthetic. Uh, the Probe is usually placed in the inguinal crease in such a way that it's uh, the probe is oriented along the crease and we get an ultrasound image as shown in this figure. So here we can see that the laterally there is the, uh, the uh, below we can see the pelvic brim and uh, laterally we have the uh, anterior inferior iliac spine and medially the, we have the iliopubic eminence. Uh, we have to deposit the local anesthetic in this plane in between the uh, two risings. Uh, it is usually as other structures like femoral artery, femoral nerve, the iliacus muscle, psoas tendon are all clear in this picture. Uh, the proceed, the needle should be advanced in, this is a, actually a, this is actually a, uh, a picture representation how the needle is inserted uh, under ultrasound guidance. You can see that the needle is inserted from the lateral end and it's uh, tip uh, until its tip hit, hits the uh, ilium, which which form the uh, pelvic brim, and the uh, local anesthetic is injected in the pelvic brim. We we need to avoid the femoral major femoral vessels and femoral nerves by uh, inserting the needle. Uh, this is the real time uh, video of the same, uh, where you can see the uh, uh, needle being advanced uh, you, under the ultrasound guidance in in plane approach, and finally hit the uh, pelvic brim and five later uh, later uh, the as shown in this area the local anesthesia is infiltrated in the uh, lower pelvic brim so uh, was ping the only option we had Absolutely not. Previously, we used to give the femoral nerve block. In femoral nerve block, we used to directly, the same method is done, ultrasound guided. We already have seen the femoral nerve. We used to deposit the uh, uh, local anesthetic over the femoral nerve itself. The, but by now, already I have 
told you that the hip joint is not just supplied by femoral, femoral nerve branches. There is also other uh, uh, like nerves like operator nerve, accessory operator nerve, which are not blocked. So it's uh, femoral nerve provides an inadequate uh, uh, analgesia. And also, as we are directing directly to the femoral nerve, there is high chance of nerve injury also in this types of block. And also, there is risk for motor block uh, leading to quadriceps paralysis in femoral. So uh, afterwards, the other another option we have is the facialia. Uh, facially at a compartment block which uh, used used to be the popular technique very recently before the pen block with the, in which the the local and CQ was uh, directly injected um, to the facial iliaca which covers the iliacus muscle uh, uh, it's it's a, actually a volume block and it charges basically the femoral nerve and the femoral lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of type here also the, the analgesia is incomplete because the operator nerve and accessory of the, for the obvious same reasons as uh, femoral nerve block. And but its only advantage or like uh, pain block is that it is better for a mid shaft femoral fracture and distal femoral fracture. But for a hip, hip fractures obviously uh, pain is superior to uh, FICB like uh, facial co compartment block. And we have done an extensive literature search, search also on the same thing. We have found one study which that RCT which is directly comparing the pen block with the uh, FICB block. In, in which, uh, in which the, there are basically like the 22 cases were uh, in the FICB wing and uh, 30 cases were included in the pen, pen wing. And uh, the pain score after 15 minutes of block was significantly better in pen block. And also the after post surgery also patient is followed up. The uh, first time for the analgesic drug consumption is significantly lower in pen group. Uh, no, significantly higher. Like the uh, first time for analgesic drug is higher in pen, pen group. And also the total op opioid use over 24 hours is also uh, better in like uh, pen group. Uh, similar studies were also uh, observation. Other studies also had a similar finding, which showed that pain is superior to the FICB uh, block. So any block, we have need to have some precaution, safety measures. It's just stop before the block, which is we need to do an aspiration uh, before the injecting the local anesthetic, so that it won't get inside the intravascular component. And, and it should be done in such a way that like after every 3 to 5 ml of the uh, local anesthetic injected, we need to uh, again re-aspirate and check and proceed. And also the uh, here comes the importance of the second person who is injecting. He is the one who will uh, understand the resistance. If there is a resistance, then we need to like he should no notify the person who is using the ultrasound and the needle so that the needle can be repositioned and any intramuscular uh, like injection can be prevented. So, uh, come, last but not least, the mo most other complication of any nerve block is the local anesthetic systemic complication, uh, which usually occurs within few minutes of injection. We, so, we need to always ask the uh, patient for any symptom, like prodromal symptoms, like periodal numbness, tinnitus, confusion, any, and uh, as it progresses, patient will have CNS symptoms like seizures, and patient may go into coma, then other cardiovascular manifestation can also occur in the form of hypotension, uh, arrhythmias, and even cardiac arrest. So you should be prepared for this, and uh, we should have a crash card, uh, which show, and crash card should contain the 20% uh, lipid emulsion, which is the drug of choice for local and systemic toxicity. Uh, to immediately stop the injection and we should proceed for the discharge of the patient according to the ACLS and give seizure. If patient is having seizure, we have to control the seizure using benzodiazepine. Uh, so, coming to the take home messages, the pain block is basically an easy to teach and easy to perform after adequate training. Basically, because uh, it's the end point is a bony landmark apart from like FICP block where we have a facial plane. So it's always easy to perform. Uh, and also it's now, uh, I'm all, already explained to you like it has less complication rates because 
uh, the volume used is comparatively low and also uh, we are avoiding the major femoral vessels and uh, uh, nerves using ultrasound also and they also provide complete analgesia when compared to other FICB and femoral nerve blocks and in our case scenario we could avoid a general anesthesia and prolong the hospital stay for this patient thank you Thank you, Dr. Ashwin Pinjavis. So, so we presented uh, uh, the main concept is to create a pain-free emergency department, which is a benchmark of producing a quality of care in the emergency department for addressing pain and also assisting procedures, which is the important integral part of emergency department. Our department is slightly different in when you're presenting CCR or CGR. We are mainly a practical you know, procedural based department with newer skills, newer technique which helps the patient on arrival. That's why the concept of block on arrival which is catching the imagination of most of the emergency department across the world where they want to avoid opiates. If you see US emergency departments, there is what is called as, there is a lot of use of opiates and the patients are getting addicted towards it. So that's why they can opiate sparing initiative is a major thing across the world and that is what we wanted to adopt. Number two is in this patient the use of opiates has got its own side effects. We know that it is not free for side effects. We all know as a clinician what are the side effects of opiate. Third is the question thing is the overlap of you know scope of practice or skill of how emergency care physicians actually are performing talks is a major question which comes in, you know, because this is a new discipline. This is a new discipline in the, you can say it is in, in a toddler stage in our country. Or uh, now it is only 12 years old. So many skills which are do we produce, we are already being done by definitive care specialty in their control environment. Now they are there in the, if you do it in the front line, we have seen in acute care on when the patient actually comes. So the scope of practice, that's why there is credentialing of key skills, you know, like giving procedural sedation and analysis. Now it is a core competency of emergency department within the scope of practice as mandated by both, you know, the whole global body as well as our own curriculum in Government of India, NMC or DNB. Second is especially regional anesthesia, you know, the use of blocks. So it is also been mandated, you know, as per American College of Emergency Physician 2017 guideline in the scope of practice, both in US, UK and Australia. Similarly, in our NMC guideline it also says that. Plus, very important is, as we said, the last line is safety is more important whenever you do any procedure. You know, enthusiasm should not, you know, say that you can be, you know, it should be safety for any procedure what we do. That's why the, there is rigorous training of this resident we have done last over last 10 years of our department. Before that I started, the journey started when I started doing in 2009 and 10, where we published first of the paper doing in emergency department. Before that emergency physicians also were not doing, you know, so one student was rotating from Queens, New York in ED and we developed few cases where the patient, the OTs are busy. They cannot be shifted for say, crash in the bracelet which was impacted and the, the old lady and she had comorbidities like COPD. So we had to avoid both giving opiates plus I had to find an answer because OTs were busy. So we gave the first blog there. I gave the first blog on brachial flex then. And several during these years, over these years of 12, 12 years of practice, we have almost published, you know, around 10 original papers on this. And also now it is mandated during the course of time that it gives answers. Because in time this tell you that the block on arrival concept, you know, if you think we are now ingrained in the, you know, many parts of the country, thesis work is being given on block on arrival concept. That is number one. So it gets to the DNA of every emergency department group. Second is the thesis within our department have addressed three things. <laughs> one is addressing pain and procedure. Second, very important, sir, I'll just tell you, 
the house is one of the few of the blocks now it is used in medical emergency like acute pancreatitis erector spinae block in acute pancreatitis i know pancreatic pain is severe most pain we all understand people gastroenterologists have been using celiac plexus block and we have demonstrated and showed the data to uh, the senior gastroenterologists with reduction of pain significant reduction of pain with non invasive all minimal invasive procedure is non invasive at least so you can address that the last but not the least the block we developed and given in in refractory ventricular tachyarrhythmias stellate ganglion block and in we saved the patient patient went home back he during the peak of covid he had a acute coronary event and you know refractory arrhythmias and the last we gave a stellate ganglion block which was also presented in our previous ccr you know the success story so last statement is addressing pain to addressing cardiac arrest it does make a difference for saving lives thank you very much for this interview good afternoon all uh, on the behalf of uh, the division of trauma surgery and critical care i dr jinesh jalan welcome you all uh, today we are going to discuss a uh, an interesting case which reemphasizes the role of cpr in trauma uh, for this uh, uh, this case will be presented by uh, dr amit he will present the case and followed by the A radiological, a radiological image uh, which will be discussed by Dr. Pius from SR from Department of Radio Diagnosis, and uh, the discussion part will be uh, discussed by Dr. Damodar. So, Dr. Amit, please. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I am going to uh, myself, Dr. Amit Kudarshi, SR in Trauma Surgery and Critical Care Division. And today I am going to discuss a very interesting trauma case that could be saved just because of consistent efforts that we will discuss now. So, a uh, 38 year old male came to our ED, uh, 19 hours post injury. Patient was referred to us, and history was given in the form of MISH, that is the mechanism of injury, and the uh, injury sustained, and signs and symptoms, and treatment received. So, uh, patient with the mechanism of LED shear fall from uh, 30 feet height onto a concrete floor, and injury sustained by blunt trauma chest with the left humerus fracture. and the uh, signs and symptoms were patient was responsive and uh, with the tachycardia it is 134 beats per minute and uh, hypotension and tachypnea treatment received outside was 1 liter pistolite fluid and 1 prbc was transfused and bilateral icd was placed outside and left uh, upper limb was splinted in view of the fracture on arrival to our ed area uh, as per our ed triage protocol patient was tried into the red area Uh, on arrival to ED, so first of all we do the primary survey. In primary survey in airway part, the airway was patent and C span was splinted and put on high flow oxygen mask. In breathing part, patient had the tachypnea and saturation was maintained and left side air entry was decreased and uh, chest compression test was positive. And bilateral ACD was in situ already placed outside with the sanguineous output. Right side 200 ml and left side 100 ml. In circulation part, patient had the tachycardia and hypotension that responded to the resuscitation and fast was negative. Patient uh, GCS was full score that is E4, V5, M6, and bilateral pupils were normally sensitive and reacting to light. And exposure part was fine. So uh, now moving to the primary survey adjuncts, chest X-ray shows the bilateral ICD in situ with the multiple red fractures. Pelvic survey was fine, and ABG shows uh, metabolic acidosis with the derived base success and lactate that concludes the patient was in class three hemorrhagic shock. Now in uh, secondary survey, uh, temporal history was insignificant. On log roll, there was no any aspirant tenderness, and distal rectal examination was with the normal limit. In external injury, patient had the laceration of the three uh, centimeter over the chin and loss of right upper incisor tooth was there, and left side humerus fracture was there. 
Now to uh, discuss the secondary survey exams, uh, the CT scan, uh, I would like to repeat uh, Dr. Piyush, SR radiology. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, in view of the polytrauma, uh, NCCT head C spine phase and C C D torso was performed. Head C spine was unremarkable. On the NCCT phase, we can see that there was presence of uh, left paraphysis uh, and uh, what left any mandible body fracture, which was present, as we can appreciate on the cinematic DRD. Uh, further on, uh, there were multiple bilateral rib fractures as seen over here. Multiple rib fractures were seen bilaterally. There was a left clavicle and left shaft of humerus fracture. There was a uh, bilateral hemothorax and there was presence of bilateral pneumothorax with bilateral IPD placed in C2 as we can see on both these sections. There was left sided sacral fracture as we can see over here and also subtly appreciated on the BRT section. Also there was presence of uh, left sided SPR, superior pubic remi and the inferior pubic remi fracture. Uh, further on, uh, from the under surface of the arch of aorta, after the takeoff of the left subclavian artery, there was presence of this contrast out uh, which was seen, which was suggestive of a pseudo aneurysm. You can see that it's well filling with the contrast and seen in continuity with the vessel. Uh, it can also be appreciated on the aerial section, and there was some surrounding mild hematoma also present. And in view of this, we uh, gave a provisional diagnosis of a pseudo aneurysm arising from the under surface of aorta, suggestive of a grade 3 aortic injury. I'll hand it back to Dr. Ahmed for further discussion. So now, uh, just after the CT, patient developed uh, sudden respiratory distress, and uh, so uh, obviously, patient was reassessed in the ED, and primary survey was repeated as uh, this is our usual protocol. After any change in the parameter, we repeat the primary survey, and again, error was reassessed that was threatened this time in view of the respiratory distress. So error was secured with the intrathecal intubation. And uh, patient had the tachypnea desaturation this time, so put on mechanical ventilator. And rest of the parameters were almost similar, so resuscitation were continued. Now, just after the 20 minutes of post intubation, patient developed uh, cardiac pulmonary arrest with the pulseless electrical activity rhythm. So immediately high quality CPR was started as per our standard ACLS protocol. And we were lucky to revive the patient after uh, one cycle of CPR, so return of spontaneous circulation was achieved. This is the basic algorithm of the ACLS that uh, as soon as we start the CPR, we just monitor the type of rhythm. If this is a ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, that is shockable. So we start uh, giving shock and alternating with the CPR and monitoring the rhythm again. And if this is a asystolic or pulses electrical activity that is more common in trauma setting, then we continue with the uh, CPR and the ADR injection. So now, uh, just uh, we revised the patient with the first cycle of CPR. Immediately, unfortunately, 20 minutes later, patient again developed second uh, cardiac arrest. But again, it was a pulse electrical activity, and we were lucky to revive the patient again with our one cycle of CPR. But unfortunately, to our surprise, 30 minutes later, patient developed third episode of cardiac arrest. But again, we were lucky to revive the patient after one cycle of CPR. So post revival, patient was reassessed. Patient had the hyperkalemia and severe metabolic acidosis for which corrections were started. Trop T was positive, but quantitative drop away is in normal limit. 2D echo was performed, that is the minimal pericardial fluid, and rest of the parameters were fine, like the left ventricle systolic function. And the ABG obviously showed the patient was in severe metabolic acidosis, for which corrections were going on. Now the question comes, why multiple cardiac arrest in this patient? So we ruled out uh, all the possible causes, like the 5H and 5T, that was the hypoxia, that could be a possible cause, and acidosis, hyperkalemia, and uh, cardiac tamponade was not there per se because EFAS was negative on primary survey. And uh, but blunt cardiac injury could not be ruled out in view of the severe uh, blunt thoracic trauma. And top T was also positive, and there was minimal pericardial fluid on 2 D echo. So now our working diagnosis was a patient with a polytrauma, very high ISS, that is 34. Patient has a blunt trauma chest with the bilateral multiple fractures, erotic injury grade three, and suspected blunt cardiac injury with the left shaft of humerus fracture and medullary facial injury. Patient was still hemodynamically unstable, so it was decided to further resuscitate the patient in trauma IC. But I show it did not end here. Just after shifting to the ICU, 30 minutes later, patient developed one more episode of cardiac arrest. But again, we were lucky to revive the patient with one cycle of CPR. Again, the rhythm was the personal activity. But to our surprise, patient again developed 20 minutes later the fifth episode of cardiac arrest. Again, the pattern was the same, in PA rhythm was there, but again, we were lucky to revive the patient after one cycle of CPR. 
So now we have the multiple issues uh, simultaneously in the ICU with this patient. Patient already had the multiple cardiopulmonary arrest for which uh, that was under, already under evaluation. And suspected blunt cardiac injury was there uh, for which we have already explained the reasons. And hyperkalemia was there for which continuation correction was going on. And patient had the severe metabolic acidosis for which backup connection and uh, hemodialysis was planned. And last but not the least, patient had the high grade erotic injury for which Tevar was planned. So now after shifting to the ICU, in first 24 hours in ICU, patient was put on mechanical ventilation, uh, sedated and bilateral air entry was equal and bilateral ACD was very minimal output that was sanguinous, 200 ml around zero sanguinous in 24 hours. In patient was with the uh, minimal nodded supports. The major issue was the decreased urine output, deranged KFT and refractory hyperkalemia. For which nephrology opinion was taken and first cycle of hemodialysis was advised. So now this is the uh, first week ICU course of the patient. In, each, in the first week, the main issue of the patient was the AKI for which nephrology opinion already taken. So that got settled with the two uh, setting of the hemodialysis. But uh, by the end of the first week, a uh, patient started throwing fever, pounds were also raised. So we were starting the sepsis. So in view of that, our the plan thoracic endovascular erotic repair, that was deferred. At the same time, on the post injury day night, in view of the prolonged intubation, we did the test. Now to look for the source of sepsis, we send all the cultures and the fever pack and all uh, the uh, tracheal culture was positive uh, for which VAP was suspected and uh, antibiotic was started. And we examined the patient thoroughly to look for any other source. There was a palpable lump in the right upper quadrant. Uh, to, and to confirm our diagnosis, USG of the done and there was very gallbladder collection. And to more to be sure about that uh, collection, we arrived finally a CCT abdomen. Now, CCT, uh, I would like uh, Dr. Pius to discuss. At the time of, uh, so CCT abdomen was done at the, uh, the time of admission uh, uh, during the trauma and subsequently a follow-up CCT abdomen was done. On admission CT, we can see that there was some mild GV wall edema. This could be attributed to many things, one of them being the continuous ongoing exacerbation and the fluid overload. Subsequent CCT abdomen was done for the query that there was a palpable upper abdominal lung and from what here what we can see that this is the enhancing mucosa of the GP which and here we can see an office uh, interruption in the enhancing wall with surrounding hypodense, ill-defined hypodense areas likely surgery of collections. There was so there was a pericholocystic collection and there was a peripancreatic collection. Also there was no appreciable hypodense calculus seen within. So uh, in consistence with the long hospital stay and the ongoing uh, treatment and the resuscitation, we gave a provisional diagnosis of a calculus colosis title uh, attributed to the long, uh, to the critical condition of the patient. Uh, and subsequent uh, surgical exploration was advised. So now final, uh, our diagnosis was the post sepsis acute uh, AKL plus cholecystitis for which surgical exploration was done and uh, upon cholecystitis was done, there was gangrenous gallbladder that resected and sent for the histopathological examination. post op course of the patient was uneventful luckily and uh, finally the uh, patient gradually improved and uh, tevar of the descending thoracic aorta was done post injury 21. And, uh, rest of the injuries like the left humerus fracture and medullary facial injury were managed non-operatively. Finally, the patient was discharged in satisfactory condition after 37 days of in hospital admission and 28 days of ICU admission. And this is the, uh, the image show the intra -op procedure of the uh, TEVAR and this is the post TEVAR chest x -ray. So now in follow up uh, after one month, uh, patient was followed in the OPD, that was fine, he has no any fresh complaints, patient has resumed his daily routine, he is a Eric Shapular by profession, he is doing his routine uh, work. And after one year, we followed the patient telephonically to us. Now the discussion part, uh, over to Dr. Damodar, SR Pramasati. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pramit. I would like to continue the discussion part of, of our case report. Basically, uh, we have encountered these issues uh, in our patient, traumatic cardiac arrest, blunt cardiac injury, acalculus cholecystitis, and blunt thoracic aortic injury. I will be discussing under these headings. Coming to traumatic cardiac arrest, it's a state of uh, extreme uh, hypovolemic shock basically for which damage control resuscitation is the option of the treatment after initial resuscitation in the ED which includes blood products and also it's a uh, multiphasic uh, approach where initial ED resuscitation followed by damage control surgery to control the hemorrhage or contamination and then followed by ICU resuscitation 
and again the definitive phase once the patient is immunologically stable. So the most common rhythm in this uh, arrest is the pulseless electrical activity as which uh, we have seen in our patient. So in these patients, actually, according to the studies, a pre-hospital CPR has a better patient survival rates by the EMS personnel, and the patients also have proven to be having a good neurological outcomes. So basically, traumatic cardiac arrest is different from a regular medical cardiac arrest, where it is a low output state due to volume loss. Whereas the, uh, in medical cardiac arrest, it is usually a no output state. So the outcome is better than in a medical cardiac arrest if addressed early in cell group of patients. So these are some of the reversible causes of traumatic cardiac arrest, hypoxia, for this uh, patient has to be oxygenated, hypooxygen and tension pneumothorax, uh, where the chest need to be decompressed immediately with a umbilical thoracostomy and cardiac tamponade, where thoracotomy is the choice of treatment and hypovolemia, for which I already discussed uh, blood, tra blood products transfusion and damage control surgery to, uh, to uh, control the hemorrhage. Uh, this is an algorithm for the traumatic cardiac arrest where the patient who arrives in uh, arrest a close CPR is performed. If the return of spontaneous circulation is achieved, bilateral ICD application further resuscitation will be continued based on the patient hemodynamics. If there is no return of spontaneous circulation, resuscitated thoracotomy will be done in the ED uh, based on the cardiac injury or the severe hypovolemia. Uh, for the thoracic injury, hemostatic uh, hemostasis will be achieved. For abdomen, the descending thoracic cardiac can be clamped, internal cardiac massage can be done. And then the patient will be taken to OT immediately once ROSC is achieved. So this is a this is a study where a pre-hospital traumatic cardiac arrest, a systematic event meta-analysis has been done in 2022, which uh, suggested approximately one in 20 patients in pre-hospital traumatic circulatory arrest will survive. About 40% of the survivors will have favorable neurologic outcome. So the, uh, many of the studies also have confirmed that pre-hospital CPR combined with advanced life support measures. Uh, will definitely improve the outcome and survival of the patient. And this is a paper published in Traumatic Cardiac Arrest, Who Are the Survivors? This uh, paper suggests that there is a better outcome in traumatic cardiac arrest patients in certain groups when compared to medical cardiac arrest after CPR. Uh, many papers prior to this have, uh, have published data where uh, CPR in trauma patients can be futile if continued and will be a, 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 lot, will be a waste of the resources. But in a cell group of patients, when addressed early, especially in pre-hospital settings and if the patient is brought early to the emergency setting, definitely traumatic patients have better outcome after, after a CPR and uh, uh, <coughs> advanced life support measures compared to medical, medical arrest of CPR. So next heading, let's discuss about blind cardiac injury. It has less than 10% of incidence. The most common mechanism is road traffic injuries. Cardiac contusions are the most common injuries. It has a wide spectrum of injuries uh, ranging from cardiac contusions up to uh, cardiac wall ruptures. Uh, it ranges from silent arrhythmias up to wall ruptures and right bundle branch block and next uh, ventricular fibrillation the most common arrhythmias and cardiac contusions. So these are uh, some of the cardiac contusion images intraoperatively from our patients, not, not in this patient. So basically cardiac, uh, cardiac, blunt cardiac injury is a diagnosis of uh, exclusion when it is supported by ECG and cardiac enzymes and also by 2D echo and uh, CT where the patient uh, has a, a vague, uh, vague, vague symptoms and also X-rays or ECG suggesting of uh, arrhythmias. And, but one is cardiac tamponade where there is hypotension, venous distension due to uh, pericardial effusion. This is a diagnosis of a clinical diagnosis where immediately the patient should be taken to OT on availability. If the patient is very unstable even to reach the OT, then needle pericardial synthesis can be attempted. And of course, in stable patients with blunt cardiac injury, supportive therapy with continuous close uh, monitoring should be done. These are the uh, range of uh, pattern of injuries which I was mentioning, cardiac contusion, valvular injuries, and coronary artery dissection, IOT dissection, septal wall defects and arrhythmias, and also cardiac wall rupture. These are this is an article where diagnostic approach for myocardial contusion, a retrospective evaluation, which I already mentioned that the best dynamic approach for myocardial contusion is a combination of electrocardiography and measurement of the cardiac biomarkers. And blend chest trauma has a wide variety of presentations, as I mentioned. It is lacking a gold standard diagnostic material. Patient needs close monitoring with supportive therapy involving multidisciplinary approach. And now coming to acute acalculus cholecystitis in critically ill patients. So basically acute cholecystitis is associated with incidence of 1, 5 to 15 percent of uh, patients and with mortality of around 45 percent. It is associated with trauma, patients in shock, patients with uh, 
prolonged bowel rest and TPM. The mechanism being ischemia and hypoperfusion of the gallbladder with altered uh, composition of the bile and gallbladder distension after uh, starvation. And most common features being patients usually are asymptomatic until they uh, present in severe sepsis. And under uh, on, on evaluation, the patient has pain and tenderness in the right upper quadrant in about uh, half to two thirds of the patients. But by the time patient present, they already are in uh, gangrenous position started with GP perforation or with uh, patient with severe sepsis. So these patients have blood culture positive 90% of cases with uh, gram to aerobic basal light. And diagnosis bedside USG, which shows a peri GB collection and a slough in the gallbladder lumen. And also a CT scan if the patient is uh, stable. And the patient should be planned for cholecystectomy based on his hemodynamic stability. If the patient is uh, unstable, we can plan for percutaneous drainage or cholecystostomy based on the patient hemodynamics. And antibiotics of choice for broad spectrum, of course, peperolis and tazobactam and carbopenems. Coming to the blend thoracic aortic injury. Uh, the most common mechanism is rotrophic injury still followed by fall from height. The basic mechanism is rapid acceleration deceleration injury and more than 80% of the patients are die on scene. And about 20% of the patient who reach the hospital will die within first 24 hours due to if the patient is immediately unstable. So aortic isthmus is the most common uh, point of injury where it is a transition point towards the mobile descending thoracic aorta. And the management usually based on the patient hemodynamics, whether it is an open management or an endovascular repair. There is a WP algorithm for the management of blunt uh, <coughs> thoracic aortic injury, where it is a grade based management. So basically, uh, Society for Vascular Surgery in 2009 has uh, graded the uh, aortic injuries into four grades. Grade 1 is intimal tear, grade 2 being the intramural hematoma, grade 3 being the pseudo aneurysm, and grade 4 being the rupture. So there is also, a new harbor view criteria added to this classification where the IoT class, uh, injuries are graded into minimal, moderate, and severe. So, minimal, minimal IoT injuries have no contour extra ab abnormality externally with uh, inter intimal tear or thrombus less than 1 centimeter. And these uh, minimal IoT injuries can be managed non operatively with uh, 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 proper vigilance with follow up imaging. In coming to moderate IoT injuries, there is external contour abnormality or intimal tear greater than 1 centimeter. These patients are to be monitored based on a gray zone where impulse control should be done and then stabilize other injuries usually. And in case of severe uh, aortic injury with active extravasation, immediate repair should be done. In most patients of the blunt thoracic aortic injury, uh, they, the injury has definitely concomitant uh, other visceral injuries along with aortic injury. Isolated aortic injuries are very rare in trauma setting. So basically, I, the management of the thoracic aortic injury will depend on the hemodynamic stability of the patient and also the pro, uh, prognosis based on the other injuries, the presentation of the other injuries. So systemic stabilization should be focused first as in our patient and definitive management can be delayed based on the patient hemodynamics. So this is a uh, article published from our trauma center by the Department of Radiology uh, and uh, Division of Trauma Surgery uh, in 2022. So basically, uh, the management of this paper completed the management of aortic injuries requires early clinical suspicion, radiological diagnosis, and timely repair. And radiologists should require access to the direct MDCT findings based on the grading of aortic injuries and management chosen. This is our uh, published by our department of trauma surgery, JPNATC. This is a clinical spectrum and outcome analysis of the blunt thoracic aortic injuries, a 10-year experience from our uh, center. This, this article is accepted for publication on uh, March 23. Basically, this article, we evaluated almost uh, 55 patients, of, so 52 patients of blunt thoracic aortic injury uh, based on various grades, grade 1, 2, 3, and 4, most of them being grade 3 aortic injuries, most of them being hemodynamically stable patients on presentation, and uh, uh, mechanism of injury, most of them being uh, our road traffic injury, as I, as, as I mentioned, and mean inju injury severity score being 25. And only one patient underwent damage control surgery for aortic injury. Most of the patients are having non-aortic injury, which made, which made them hemodynamically unstable. And these patients uh, underwent damage control surgery for non-aortic injury, not for the aortic injury. So in some of the patients, the definitive management of aortic injury was delayed because of the systemic stabilization of the patient. And also, this is the grade-wise management of the aortic injury at our, at our center. 
with uh, one two patients underwent surgical repair and 20 sorry 28 uh, patients of uh, grade 3 injuries underwent surgical repair and rest of them are managed non operatively and we had only one mortality uh, regarding aortic injury and seven patients had mortality with regard to non aortic injuries most of them being uh, traumatic brain injury patients uh, this is the final outcome analysis which i was <coughs> stating so this study concluded that endovascular stunt repair is a preferred mode of management in hemodynamically stable patients with high grade aortic injuries and minor grade aortic injuries can be managed non operatively with uh, different uh, surveillance when follow up imaging the final outcome of this patient correlates with the grades of aortic injury hemodynamic stability and on arrival and also severity of the concomitant visceral injuries which will decide the management of the patient these are other articles which also uh, you strength to the same statement, delayed repair of the stable blunt thoracic aortic injury associated with improved survival, irrespective of the presence or not of major associated injury. However, delayed repair is associated with the long length of ICU stay. And patients undergoing delayed repair have improved survival compared with those repaired with first 24 hours of injury. And now the take home <coughs> message from our department is that outcome of CPR in trauma patients is definitely different from non trauma patients clearly pertaining to their young uh, age with the trauma patients who are the working com working community of the uh, of the country usually are young patients and also patients are without comorbidities so hence never give up on these multiple cpr attempts in a trauma patient which definitely improves the survival and outcome now i request my professor dr subodh kumar to address this. thank you dr namodar and uh, before we uh, open the case for discussion i want to make two comments Number one, the message of this case is very clear that uh, the trauma, in trauma, the CPR is different from the medical conditions because these patients are usually young, number one. They do not have any, usually don't have any comorbid conditions too. So there is a time to re redefine the CPR in trauma patients like uh, we say commitment, perseverance and resolve. And that actually paid in this patient. Number two, that traumatic aortic injury is a potentially life threatening condition. And it does not require immediate intervention. So first you have to make the patient hemodynamically stable. And then you go for the TEVAR. And TEVAR is used nowadays. And uh, we are grateful to our uh, radiologist and the cardiac radiology department for providing the, uh, the service to these patients. The cost of which is around 3 to 3.5 lakh rupees. <coughs> and uh, I want to put in record, Dr. Malhotra was sitting here. He has given us a blanket permission because these patients do not, cannot afford this. Uh, so he said that uh, so what, uh, th no patient should die because of the lack of the uh, stent. So in fact, while we are presenting this case, Another patient is undergoing TEVAR in cardiac radiology right now. And recently we have shown that we have published our experience of 55 cases in the last 10 years. Uh, and probably to the best of our knowledge, this is the largest syringe in India we have. Uh, now the case is open for discussion. I request uh, Professor Naranga for his comments and Dr. Chumban. Uh, then.
Thank you, thank you very much, sir, for your valuable comments and suggestions. Uh, we could rule out the, uh, because there was a uh, ICD in C2, so bleeding we could rule out, we got the eco done, that could rule out many things. But yes, TROP T was positive in this case. That could be because post CPR also. Yeah, quite possible. It's not necessarily that he had the cardiac conduction beforehand. And uh, the again, the hypoxia and the metabolic acidosis could be because of the CPR. Uh, we don't know really. Uh, Professor Chumbar. Just congratulations. Uh, now the case is uh, open for discussion. Yeah, Sanjeev. Absolutely, because yeah. So we we work in the uh, trauma emergency. We have uh, the a team of uh, senior residents uh, from trauma surgery and the emergency medicine, and they work in uh, close uh, cooperation in the emergency. Sir. Uh, 